Okay, well, let's kick off then, shall we? Well, good morning and welcome once again to Grace Church's online Sunday morning service. Uh, let me read a few verses. Well, uh, let me read a whole psalm. This is Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation to come as your people and gather, not personally, but very, in a very real way, in spirit and in truth, as we gather spiritually around your throne to listen to your word, to praise your holy name, uh, to plead with you for the needs of this, our world. Heavenly Father, meet with us today, we pray. Would we hear your voice? And as your sheep, would we follow you? For Jesus' name's sake, we ask. Amen. Now, here we are starting uh, a, uh, our second lockdown and uh, all kinds of plans have been spoiled, haven't they? Uh, all kinds of things that we, we uh, are having to do that we wouldn't have chosen. And uh, a few months ago, as a church, we recorded a version of He Will Hold Me Fast. Such a wonderful hymn that reminds us who we are and uh, what our security depends on. Not the freedom to go out and do what we want, not uh, uh, the, uh, the, the viral numbers in our area, but the fact that Christ has hold of us and none can snatch us out of his hand. So we're gonna sing that together. He will hold me fast.
Well, it's lovely to see a few faces that uh, maybe you haven't seen uh, very much of uh, recently. Uh, sorry, I realise I've included the version there that doesn't have the su subtitles, but I hope, uh, hope you could really belt out the chorus and uh, enjoy the words there. They're beautiful, aren't they? Uh, let me get my notices up so I know what to say. Um, just to, uh, uh, you, I'm sure you know this already, but uh, because of this new lockdown, uh, our evening service has not is not able to go ahead physically this evening, um, but it will be streamed online at half past six. And uh, uh, looking at the next of our ultimate questions, and this time, uh, having looked at God having made the world and having created humanity for uh, for this uh, prime place uh, of responsibility and honour within creation, we're going to ask the question: What went wrong? Uh, so that's the subject of tonight's meeting, um, half six uh, this evening. Uh, and uh, on Saturday, it's Halloween. Now, uh, there may be plenty of kids in your neighbourhood who uh, need to have cancelled their plans for a party or something like that, or are just missing their school friends, and uh, particularly with the, uh, the dark evenings and all of that sort of thing. Well, we're uh, I'm going to host a children's party a light party on zoom uh six o'clock till seven o'clock on saturday evening there'll be uh crafts and um uh some activity some games that we can play over zoom it's for the family okay so uh it means we don't need to worry about uh, uh permission slips and all that sort of thing so you know join with them and take part and there'll be a talk on the man that monsters have nightmares about okay so uh Hopefully that'll be great fun and uh, a great opportunity. So we're not just going to publicise it far and wide on social media, but if uh, you've got kids and they want to come, or if uh, uh, they have friends in the neighbourhood and you want them to be invited, get in touch and we'll get the invitations out. Uh, and uh, uh, there'll be some uh, some glow sticks and a few other bits and pieces, goodie bags to drop around. And uh, uh, oh, and. Uh, question yeah big kids can join as well uh, Aaron so you're very welcome uh, so we're, we're going to play we're going to celebrate and uh, rejoice that uh, the one who has conquered evil uh, has come into the world the, the light of the world stepped into our darkness okay light party that's next Saturday uh, on Sunday morning uh, Jonathan will be preaching for us he's uh, preaching for free school court, court this morning and uh, he'll be with us uh, next Sunday morning um, so let me, I'm going to stop speaking and hand over to, uh, uh, to for, for, uh, for the memory verse. You, you know about the home groups. If you don't know about the home groups, ask. The home groups are happening. Uh, over to Aaron and Beth. October, which means it's the last week they'll be learning this verse. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. In week one, Liam gave us a fantastic overview of who Peter was, the man that wrote this letter. We learned how Peter was an apostle who had an amazing life. He got to witness the life of Jesus and loads of other amazing things that Jesus did while he was on earth. Peter was one of the great church leaders and he would often write letters to these churches and to Peter is an example of one of these letters. So here Peter encourages us in the last verse of the whole letter to grow in grace and knowledge of God by reading God's word and praying to him every day. 
In week two, we told you all about grace and how it is something that is given freely to us by God. We thought on the example of Corrie ten Boom, who showed amazing grace to a man who had her arrested and she said that she would forgive him. God wants us to show the same grace to others as he shows to us every single day. Now last week, Liam did a great job of telling us what it is to have knowledge of God and his word. He used the example that you could easily know what music is. But does that really mean that you can play music without any practice? Of course not. In the same way, if you just know about God, that doesn't mean you have a true relationship with him. Like we can and should do. We know that the only way to have a true knowledge of God, we need to live our lives reading the Bible and praying every day and living out what we learn. If you don't truly know God yet, you need to pray to him, tell him you're sorry for all the bad things you've done and that you want him to take control of your life and save you from your sins. When you've done this, you are ready to grow, grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Let's have the verse one more time and then we'll have the song. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Thank you very much, uh, uh, each of you. Um, we're going to uh, sing again, and uh, this is uh, uh, another children's song. It's uh, uh, it was written by this chap, uh, Colin Buchanan, uh, just after the the uh, 9 11 attacks uh, back in 2001. His daughter was very young at the time and uh, very upset by things that she'd seen on. The, uh, the news and uh, he wrote this song to reassure her. The fact that terrible things happen, disappointing things happen, doesn't change the fact that Jesus is king and he's on the throne. And in times when people might feel a bit unsettled uh, and uh, disappointed, I think this is a great hymn to, uh, to sing once more. The Lord is king. Might have seen bad things happening on the TV news You might be worrying about the world and wonder what'll happen to you well, Put your trust in God alone Cause He's still sitting on His mighty throne And the Lord is King He's gonna look after everything Everything and wonder why there's so much pain why we let the same mistakes happen over and over again our sinful ways will always fail but God in his ways will prevail because the Lord is king he's gonna look after everything everything the Lord He's gonna look after everything, every single thing in this world. Cause this is his world. It's 
There's some uh, children's songs with fantastic words that uh, can be such a blessing to us, aren't there? Um, so uh, Peter is uh, is now going to lead us in prayer. So uh, over to Peter Isaac. Okay, let us pray. Let us spend a few moments in silence and quiet in our hearts. It is good to realize that even though physically we are in different places, spiritually we are gathered together in God's name and he is in our midst. If that is so, then we are just a small part of a great throng of millions of people all over the world, or people that are redeemed by the blood of Christ, and all of us collectively stand before the throne of God. We are in the presence of God, who is sovereign in authority, awesome in glory, and infinite in all his attributes. It is a privilege to just be alive in his presence, but to address him as Father and speak out our hearts before him is privilege beyond earthly comprehension. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, as we quiet on our hearts before you, we realize that we are here and not consumed by your awesome holiness, only because of the completed work of our Lord Jesus Christ and the robes of righteousness that he has provided us, even if we don't realize it and in our human foolishness approach you in self-righteousness. Even when we look to you sporadically and fleetingly, your adoring grace never leaves us. <clears throat> Young parents grow, gaze longingly at their newly born babies, but physical tiredness catches up and they fall asleep. But you never tire of gazing at us. With your loving, adoring gaze, you never slumber or sleep. How awesome is your love for us, Lord. We thank you for your forgiveness of our sins in Jesus, our Lord. If we have taken this for granted, <clears throat> forgive us and grant us grace to esteem the value of this precious gift and bring us to the realization in our hearts of the inestimable value of the treasure you have bestowed upon us in the person and work of Jesus. We look around and see chaos, confusion and devastation whether it is lives, families, or communities ravaged by war, disease, social unrest, political rivalries, and whatnot. Everywhere Christian values are under attack, whether it is Christian marriage or family values or gender issues. We see so much misery and our hearts grow faint. We acknowledge that there is only one way that all this can be settled, and so we look to you intervene dear god we so desperately need you and your healing power <clears throat> you 
And if you should choose to make us part of your solution, grant us grace and courage to stand up and be counted among the privileged. We bring our community of Prigend and our nation before you at this difficult time. As our leaders grapple with difficult issues, like a balanced response to COVID, the economy, Brexit, etc., grant them wisdom and humility to think of others as better than themselves and to put the collective interest above self-interest. Whether they know it or not, whether they acknowledge it or not, they are appointed by you, stewards of your property, and answer to one who knows their every thought and motivation. We remember our brothers and sisters all over the world who are not able to meet as comfortably as us for various reasons. You don't need us to inform you of their plight, but we unite our hearts with them before your throne of grace. If the need and opportunity should arise to sit beside them on the ash heap, grant us grace, O oh Lord, to readily put on sackcloth and sit with them, not as Job's comforters, but as channels of your peace and comfort. Anoint join afresh with your Holy Spirit as he speaks, and open our hearts to your Holy Spirit as he continues to do his work of grace in us. We ask all this in the sweetest of all names. Amen. 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 Thank you, Peter. And uh, that's a wonderful introduction to our third hymn. It's uh, the one we finished with last week. Peter talked about, uh, well, it reminded us that uh, we are united with people from all nations around the throne of Christ, spiritually speaking. And uh, had a lot, lot of comments about this, uh, this hymn um, that we finished with last week. Uh, people from 50 different uh, tribes and, 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 uh, and languages uh, singing praises to the Lord Jesus in their own language and uh, the chance to join in uh, with them uh, was just quite beautiful. So uh, we haven't had enough of this yet, so uh, uh, we're going to sing it again uh, now. Uh, Amazing Grace.
so much has changed in our world lately. 疫情中这么多人失去生命，显明了生命的脆弱与短暂。Pero la asombrosa gracia y amor de Jesús es más fuerte que la vida y la muerte. Wo auch immer du bist, ruf seinen Namen an. Jesus. 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 Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Jesus. Don't wait another day. It's a beautiful、uh, hymn to sing, isn't it? And a beautiful reminder of uh, the uh, the great worldwide church that we're a part of, and what makes us a part of that church: the privilege of being recipients of God's amazing grace. Let's turn to one Corinthians chapter six, and、uh, we're going to read together verses one to eleven. One Corinthians chapter six. If、uh, your page numbering is the same as the church Bibles, and I know for some of you it is, and、uh, you, know, you find it difficult to find the page, it's page one one four seven, one Corinthians chapter six.、Uh, as we've saw, I've seen in previous weeks,、uh, Paul is staging an intervention with this letter for this church in Corinth that he has planted and that he loves so much. As we've seen. Already, that their problem is that they are altogether far too impressed with themselves. They are massively puffed up, as he calls it, in danger of going bang. And we've seen、uh, various examples of this. We've seen this by their、uh, infighting over which preacher they like the best. They think they're better than one another.、Uh, we've seen it in their desire to edit the gospel to make it more acceptable to people in their community. Just imagine the arrogance to hear the timeless word of God and think, Do you know what? I reckon I can do better、uh, if I tweak it a bit.、Um, I can improve it. And last week we've seen that they've been tolerating scandals within the church. So as he deals with each issue, Paul is lovingly letting the air out of the balloon,、uh, kind of deflating their ego. He's not.、Uh, he's confronting their sin and pride, not as an enemy, but as a friend and skillful surgeon, battling to save his his patient. Let's、uh, have a look.、Uh, chapter six, verse one. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people, or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the worlds? And if you are to judge the worlds, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that? We will judge angels. How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. It's possible that there is no one,、uh, nobody among you, wise enough to judge a dispute between believers. But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this. In front of unbelievers, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. You、uh, and you do this to your brothers and sisters, or do you not know that wrongdoers? Will not inherit the kingdom of heaven of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolater, or, or idol, sorry, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Paul is addressing this church in Corinth, and he demonstrates to them in this passage 
that the gospel transforms our outlook. It, uh, it must give us a new perspective. Uh, first of all, a, a new vision of who the people of God are. That's verses one to five. A new vision of our purpose in life. A new vision of sin's pollution of our souls. A new vision uh, and uh, a new view of the purifying work of God. So there we go. Uh, people, purpose, pollution and purifying, if that helps you remember it. A new vision of the people of God. Have a look at verse one again, please. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Now, Jewish communities throughout the Roman uh, Empire were tolerated rather than loved uh, by uh, by the Romans and uh, the pagan races. They were given certain privileges like exemption from having to join in the national pagan sacrifices. But there was often a simmering undercurrent of suspicion and resentment as a result. Uh, because, because of this, the Jews would never take a fellow Jew to court in front of Gentiles. They didn't want the Romans talking about these quarrelsome Jewish uh, uh, this quarrelsome, quarrelsome Jewish minority and how they were always having to sort out their annoying bickering. It would have brought shame to the whole community. Instead, they would bring their dispute uh, before the, the rabbis and together agree to abide by their verdicts. There are, there are always going to be disputes between people and the people of God are no exception. Uh, until we are sinlessly perfect in heaven, in that case, we'll all see everything clearly and uh, and be able to get on uh, about everything but until then people by definition are always going to think that they're right and if you're at all competitive at sports uh, you'll always think that the, the ball landed the side of the line that helps you win and uh, if you're politically active then you're natural you will naturally interpret news stories and statistics in the way that uh, best suits your cause uh, it's called confirmation bias. We tend to uh, prefer looking at news stories and evidence that affirms us. And uh, we're, we tend to doubt and avoid uh, evidence that confronts us. That's why we make judges recuse themselves if a case involves someone that they know. It's not that we're saying, look, we're convinced you're, that you are deceitful and that's what you want to be. We're just not sure that they are able to be objective in that case. It's, it's, it's very difficult to do so. From the very first months of the Israelite nation existing after they, they'd come out of uh, slavery in Egypt, Moses was up from dawn till late at night judging disputes between the people, as we saw uh, in Exodus 18 uh, in August when Don was preaching. The first thing I want you to notice is that this is not talking, this ban on taking each other to courts, it's talking about the civil courts, where you have the option of suing someone or not. Whatever has happened to you in the past, and whatever might happen to you in the future, please don't let anyone ever point you to this passage as an excuse to cover up a crime or not to report abuse. I can imagine this being the type of verse that was quoted to the victims of Catholic priest sex abuse scandals to persuade victims to keep quiet and not embarrass their organization. I, I don't have evidence of that. It's just the sort of thing that I'm sure would have been used. The Bible is very clear that the state wields the sword to punish wrongdoing. That's uh, Romans 13, if you want to go and read it through later. And uh, the state has the God given right and responsibility to investigate and prosecute crimes. So this is not talking about criminal matters, but clarifying the grey areas in contracts or sorting out family mediation or, or pointing out where someone is acting unreasonably. It's certainly not there to prevent anyone from reporting a crime. God doesn't do cover-ups, okay? He's not worried about having bad PR. He doesn't need your efforts at spinning what happens, and he hates hypocrisy remember he is a god of justice 
Uh, God sees everything that happens on the day of judgment. He will expose it all. Everyone will know. And he hates inju injustice. I'm sure if uh, you've been a Christian any length of time, you'll remember the story of David and Bathsheba. Uh, David got away with his crime. No one knew about, about it. He had covered it up. And the only people who knew about it was God and himself. Now, that, uh, there was a huge scandal to break there. Uh, you know, this was uh, a man, King David, that God had handpicked himself. He was someone who uh, was a type of what the Lord Jesus would be, this shepherd king uh, who uh, taught the people, uh, and led them in worship. Now, if God was ever going to cover up scandals, he would have kept quiet about that one, uh, wouldn't he? If he was ever worried about it, that's the big one. Uh, and all he had to do was just keep quiet. No one else knew. And uh, But God told Nathan the prophet and told him to go and confront David. It had to be dealt with. Um, and uh, so if God isn't going to cover up David's sin and hush it up, we can be certain that actually he hates our hypocrisy too. Uh, he thinks that we need to deal with it. He will confront us with it. And uh, if we continue to try and hush it up, uh, God will act to expose it. That God thinks that genuine repentance and authentic faith is uh, is worth sacrificing um, some uh, some PR and, uh, and a people's false view of uh, of how good we are. He's not going to cover up, uh, hush up your sin or my sin or anyone else's either. No, what this passage is saying is that if you really understand what the church is, then you'd never dream. Of, take it, of suing an unbeliever, uh, sorry, suing a fellow believer and asking unbelievers to decide a dispute between two Christians. Uh, this may seem confusing, but let's have a look at what the reasons are that he gives. The first one is a matter of wisdom. Have a look at verse one again. If anyone has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment? instead of before the Lord's people. Have a look at verse four as well. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? Now, he's not talking about judges in general there. Recognise that they're living in Corinth. Uh, the, uh, the, the great and the good in Corinth were very much part of the pagan system, very much engaged in the uh, you know, using prostitutes for as part of their 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 cultural worship in the temple, and taking a dispute to court is, uh, in essence, is saying to the judge, "Hey, listen, we can't agree between ourselves what is the righteous way to behave in this particular situation. So, we need you to teach us to 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 rule in terms of what is the righteous way to behave, and then we will be forced." To that and when i put it in that way you can understand paul's horror at christians together being engaged in a dispute and going before the secular courts in corinth to ask them to adjudicate in their disputes the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom says proverbs in several places the pagans have rejected god and don't know his ways however the church, here is, in the church is a collection of people who, in theory at least, are growing in the knowledge of God and his ways and are daily conforming their lives more and more to the revealed wisdom of God and the likeness of the Lord Jesus. They should be far wiser about what is the righteous way to live than any pagan judge. But are they? Have a look at verse five. He's very rude in verse five, isn't he? Uh, lovingly so, but rude nonetheless. Uh, nonetheless. Verse five. Um, I say this to shame you. OK, he's I mean, shame is a very big deal in, in many cultures, isn't it? Shame uh, to ha have shame brought to you is unbearable in some societies. But Paul is 
doing this drastic thing to help them reassess their, their pride in themselves and their attitude to their sin. Uh, verse five, I say this to shame you. Um, is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Remember, they were very proud of their wisdom. They're looking down their nose at Paul's preaching, being too simplistic and basic. Uh, he said, I, but are you yourselves saying that as a church, there's no one in your congregation who you respect highly enough, who seems to follow God well enough uh, to uh, uh, to understand God's will better than uh, a, an idol worshipping judge? Second reason is uh, qualifications. Uh, verse, this is two and three. Or do you not know? That the Lord's people will judge the world. And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Now, reading this passage may raise some eyebrows. I mean, uh, I don't know any Christians who read this passage for the first time and said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew that we were going to judge angels. Oh, yeah, yeah. I knew all that sort of thing. But Paul is writing before much of the New Testament is written. So they studied the Old Testament far more closely than we than maybe we do. And Paul knew they'd be familiar with Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is a really important uh, chapter. That's the chapter that Jesus was referring to when he keeps calling himself the son of man. Uh, and then at his uh, his trial before the Sanhedrin in the Gospels, we read that uh, they couldn't agra agree on whether they had enough evidence to charge Jesus before Pilate. Uh, and uh, in the end, he was asked directly, are you the Messiah? At which point Jesus quoted Daniel 7 verse 13, applied it to himself. And it was on that basis that the Sanhedrin killed him. Uh, those verses describe Jesus as uh, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, so it's talking about God the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So it's a very important chapter, and as it continues, uh, verse 27, uh, we read, then the sovereignty, power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. So the church, it says here, the people of God is more than a, just a group of people who have repented of their sin and trusted the Lord uh, trusted the good news about Jesus and are now living their life together, trying to support one another in following him. Uh, it isn't less than that. If it is less than that, it's not really a church. They're not really Christians if it is less than that. But the people of the, the, this passage is saying that the people of the most high God will reign with Christ forever, will be given authority to hold to account the angels, the fallen angels, uh, will be involved in the judgment of the world. I mean, not really sure what that will look like, but it's there in black and white. And Paul expected these people to know about it. Uh, the, the people in church may be nothing in the eyes of the world. They may not look very impressive. Uh, we may get all kinds of things wrong, but you wait until that day when who they truly are is revealed when when we are given resurrection bodies when our minds are completely renewed when we are able to love god with hearts that no longer sin and love one another with uh, sinless love uh, and there with that clarity and greatness and beauty and glory that the glory that god has poured out on the sun as it's shared with us that the church is something incredibly beautiful eternal and holy god has chosen the church to join christ in holding the world and angels to account and yet here are these guys thinking that uh, 
um, there is uh, uh, thinking that uh, there's they're, they're not sufficiently qualified uh, to judge, you know, that contract uh, or, or someone who is currently um, uh, no, no more um, qualified to judge that contract than someone who is uh, currently facing condemnation on that day. It's a horrific idea, isn't it? Uh, and clearly they've made a mistake. The church listens to God and so is eternal and highly honoured by God. If the Corinthians uh, understood that, then their attitude to her would be totally transformed. And let's face it, so would ours. Our attitude of uh, how we treat one another, how we treat the assembly of, of, of wanting to serve and encourage one another. But we, so first of all, there's a new vision of the people of God. And secondly, there's a, a new vision for our purpose in life. Have a look at verse six. But instead, one brother takes another to court and this in front of unbelievers. We've already seen that public speaking was a popular form of entertainment in Corinth. And so you can imagine the pleasure that they would uh, take at a good public trial, um, be kind of their version of uh, Judge Judy or Je the Jeremy Kyle show, I suppose. I mean, especially if you've got a couple of skillful bar barristers thrashing it out with these uh, amazing speeches and a particularly juicy case. I mean, maybe even more when they don't have skillful barristers. I mean, maybe that's the uh, attraction of uh, um, the Jeremy Kyle show. Uh, but uh, in Israel, the place to decide disputes was at the city gates. But for the Greeks, it was in the marketplace, right in the heart of town. It was there in front of all these gawping spectators that Christians had been washing their dirty linen in public. Uh, kind of like uh, you know, going on the Jeremy Kyle show and hoping that having him mediate for them uh, would uh, improve their situation and, uh, and their esteem in the community. I mean, probably not, eh? But uh, uh, one of you, um, uh, but, but if you're taking each other to court in this way, I mean, one of you would be not just out of pocket, but would, we, would be publicly shamed by the whole city. Uh, we would be publicly told, look, you're the one acting unreasonably. You're the one who's got it wrong. Pay up and stop behaving so badly. The advantage, however, of going to the city courts is that, of course, they have the power to enforce their judgments. You and your opponent might choose a judge or mediator within the church to resolve your dispute. But if uh, they suddenly stormed out and they didn't, things didn't go their way and they said, oh, I've changed my mind. I no longer respect this judge. I'm not going to obey what they say. Then they may face, you know, discipline within the church. But, you know, there's no church bailiffs there. No police to arrest them or throw them in jail or, or force them to uh, pay their fines. Uh, but Paul points out that if they go to the pagan courts, even the guy that wins has lost already. Have a look at verse seven. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? It's an odd question, isn't it? Because straight away we can think of all kinds of reasons why we don't want to be cheated. I mean, first, it's the principle of the thing. You can't let people get away with doing wrong things. It goes against every instinct of justice. You don't want to be a doormat for them to trample all over you. Uh, being cheated makes us angry. We don't want it. Uh, and presumably there's money or property that's at stake and which you are convinced is rightfully yours. Now, whether you worked hard for it or whether your parents did and you expected to inherit it, it's precious to you. And you don't want someone else who doesn't deserve it uh, to uh, swoop in and take it all. You might have devoted a significant amount of your life, your time and your energy into creating this wealth or, or sharing in it with your parents or whatever it is. And you can't have other people snatching it away. So how can he say in verse seven, you've been completely defeated already? Well, Paul clearly intends them to be fighting a very different battle uh, than they think they're fighting. 
they're battling each other in courts. And he says, no, 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 you're fighting the wrong battle. And the battle you should have been fighting has been lost whilst you squabble about uh, this particular lawsuit. So imagine that Bob and Jeff are two Christians who have a dispute. Bob the builder uh, quoted uh, 200 quid to do some work for Jeff, but it took longer than he thought. And now that it's done, he wants 300 quid. Jeff says that it's Bob's fault. He should have worked harder. And uh, he and that Jeff shouldn't have to pay for all of Bob's long tea breaks. They're both sure they're right. Um, you know, Bob thinks that Jeff is being stingy. The job is just harder than he orig originally thought. He's uh, both thinks the other one is trying to cheat them out of what is rightfully theirs. And they get angry with one another. Uh, both think the other person is being unreasonable. And so together they go to the small claims courts. The judge, however, that day is Veronica. Veronica's Christian neighbour, Gertrude, has, uh, has trusted in Jesus and has been asking Veronica to come to church and to read the Bible for herself and see the great God that Gertrude has found, who has forgiven her sins and uh, uh, has changed Gertrude's heart, has taken away her selfishness and pride so that Gertrude is no longer living for the things of this world but for Christ himself and for his kingdom. That God so loved the world that he gave us his son. And now his people are called to love each other, to love their neighbor and even love their enemy. Judge Veronica knows that it is by this everyone will know that we are Jesus' disciples if we love one another. And then in come these two Christians, well known as Christians, wanting to sacrifice their fellowship, love, their obedience to Jesus and their gospel witness for the sake of a hundred quid and a bit of pride. They're effectively saying, we know the all wise, loving creator of the universe, but we need your help, Veronica, to get on. We need the help of the pagans in this court because we don't know together uh, what the righteous way of life is. It's getting a bit dark in here, isn't it? At that moment, Judge Veronica knows that uh, however much these Christians say that Jesus is their priceless treasure, that uh, they are living their lives for him and that he is their God. He is their all in all. You, she knows at that moment that actually you can put a price on Bob and Jeff's love for Jesus. And it's somewhere less than 100 pounds. That is a terrible defeat for both of them, isn't it? And it's a terrible defeat for the mission of the entire church. The shame and damage would be well worth sacrificing that hundred quid for. It would be well worth sacrificing any amount for. Have a look at verse eight. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. See, when we realise what the church is, this eternal kingdom of God, this community that lasts beyond this life on into uh, uh, into heaven, heaven descended to earth, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, when we realise what our role in it is in this life, to bear witness to the Lord Jesus, to live lives that reflect his goodness and glory and make disciples of all nations, then we realise that we're, we're playing a different game. Our lives are not just about accumulating wealth, making people think that we're quite nice. Uh, nothing like that. No, no, no. We have a job to do to declare Christ to the world. That's why we get in the, up in the morning and go to do our jobs. That's why we earn money. That's why we raise our children. That's why we um, do everything that we do. It's not for our own benefits. It's for him. And we are totally defeated if we start squabbling in front of unbelievers we're bound to disagree sometimes find someone that you both trust a believer who loves god and is mature in their faith who can be impartial and just ask them look what would you do because we're too close to this we can't see clearly but we'll submit to what you say we've seen uh, a new vision of the people of god a new vision for, of our purpose in life a new vision of sin's pollution have a look 
at verse nine. These are strong words, aren't they? Verse nine. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, I'm sure that Bob and Jeff haven't really thought through about what they're doing. But if they have and then go ahead, Paul is saying to them that heaven is not for them. We've got to let the, these words sink in, don't we? Because they are incredibly stark words and we need to feel their full force as we've said already we all suffer from confirmation bias not just in sport and politics or things like that no we we suffer from confirmation bias in our own lives uh, in our personal lives we are very good at justifying our own behavior and dodging criticism for it and then we look over at other people's sin uh, that's not shared by us and we see it very very clearly and we can easily get to the point of thinking that we're much better than they are when the reality is our sin is just different from this because we had to rationalize our own sin to do it in the first place. We're familiar with the pressures and the factors that uh, made it such a temptation for us. Uh, and then when we are confronted with our, our sin, we have a choice. We can either grieve over it Ask for forgiveness, make restitution if that's possible and ask the Holy Spirit's help to change. Or we can say, never mind. That's why Jesus died, isn't it? There's always grace. Never mind. It's fine. Now, that's a very dangerous attitude, isn't it? Jeremiah was warned about it. We, we read Jeremiah in our home groups uh, a, a couple of months ago and uh, uh, God was furious with the prophets uh, of their time, who healed the hurt of his people cheaply. Imagine that you are a professional goalkeeper and uh, you see the ball coming flying towards your goal. And uh, and you could save it, but it would be a hassle. You know, you get your clothes dirty in diving and you think, never mind. We've got great strikers. That's what they're for. You know, as long as we score more than we let in, we'll be fine, you know. No goalkeeper is perfect. After all, they can't expect perfection from me. No one's ever, no goalkeeper has ever been perfect. But, you know, never mind. You know, a goalkeeper like that wouldn't keep his position, would he? You'd never expect, a, a goalkeeper like that would never expect to share in the rewards of his team, uh, to, to belong to his team, to be welcomed and congratulated by his manager. So let's apply it. If we say that we're Christians and that our sin is what put Jesus on the cross, then let's take this seriously. Our sin is what has ruined the world and spoiled it. That's the reason for the curse. That's the reason for the suffering and pain in the universe. Uh, and, and now as Christians, we're doing something else. You know, before we were ignorant, but now we know God's. And we've heard what his word says. And now we're disobeying against knowledge. That's something else, isn't it? If we do not hate our sin and strive to be rid of it and strive to be as much like the Lord Jesus as possible, knowing that we'll never be perfect, but but trying to make as much progress as we can. If we're not like that. Can we really believe that gospel after all? Can we really be saved if that's our attitude? Now, I know what that, that, that self-justifying instinct that's yeah, there in me and it's probably there in you right now at the moment. And we want to play some uh, philosophical games about God's sovereignty and once saved, always saved and all that sort of thing. But notice this. The, the New Testament is full and the old. The, the Bible is full of warnings to professing Christians who take God's grace for granted and so continue in their sin. And they are very real warnings. And they're not there just because the writer was bored and just wanted to write some doodles. They are real. We must take them very seriously. Uh, some of you will be familiar with uh, the novel The Silver Chair, one of the Narnia Chronicles by C.S. Lewis, and uh, there the uh, the main characters set out 
to go and rescue a prince. As a prince, he's the heir of the kingdom and uh, he has a mortal enemy, this uh, dragon that uh, killed his mother. And he goes out to do battle with it. But at some point uh, he was seduced by it. And now it has won him over. And occasionally he's in his right mind. Just for a, a bit of time each day, he's in his right mind and he sees clearly who his enemy is and what he should be doing. But he's strapped down to this silver chair, uh, which leaves him unable to do anything about it. Inert. Uh, and uh, the rest of the time he's in this mad state where he thinks that uh, the dragon is his friend and he's eager to do her bidding. Uh, and uh, to go to war against his own people. Maybe this morning you are in your right mind for the first time in a while. Maybe there's some sin that has occasionally been on your conscience, but you've, you've, you've not managed to do anything about it. You've not got around to it. There's been some kind of inertia in you that uh, has meant you've put it off till later. Well, the story in, in, uh, in Narnia is that uh, actually that, that window of sanity is closing. Slowly, his uh, conscience is getting uh, calloused uh, and, uh, and it bothers him less and less. Do you know what? He, C.S. Lewis was onto something, wasn't he? We, we're in a very dangerous situation if we're saying, never mind, there's always grace. We need to do what uh, Prince Rinian did in the story. The first chance he got, he grabbed his sword and he smashed up that silver chair uh, before his madness returned to him. Uh, look, uh, if there's some sin that you're battling with or that actually you're not battling with, it's just sat there in your life and uh, you've said, oh, never mind. Uh, th thankfully, there's grace. It doesn't really matter that much. It's not like somebody else's sin. That's, I mean, that's really bad. We need to take action, don't we? The, the New Testament keeps talking about putting to death the flesh, that part of our, our ourselves that, uh, that, that is at war with the Lord Jesus. Remember what uh, the Beatitudes said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So those that aren't cocky and arrogant, but, uh, uh, but, but are humble. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not the others, those ones. Blessed are those who mourn, mourn over their sin, they're grieved by it, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Maybe once we hungered and thirsted more than we do today. It's a dangerous position, isn't it? Take action about your sin. Confess it to someone you trust. Uh, if uh, there's something you're not sure about, ask guidance from a mature Christian uh, who, uh, who knows God well and, uh, and do what is necessary. Uh, to avoid that temptation. Uh, maybe there are certain people that you think, okay, I can't be alone with them because I don't behave in a godly way when I am. Maybe there's, uh, you know, maybe if you're alone late at night watching TV, suddenly this urge comes over you uh, to see some naked ladies. And uh, maybe you just think, okay, I demonstrated I can't be godly under those circumstances. So I just need to not be in that position. Maybe there's certain people that, when you're with them, you always joke around in a way that is really unhelpful and to degrades other people. And you think, OK, I, I just need to special prayer. I need to confess that I need friends to to pray with me so that I can be godly under those circumstances. We need to take action, don't we? Whilst our sanity is with us. We've got a new vision of the people of God, a new vision for our purpose in life, a new vision of sin's pollution. And then finally, a new vision of, uh, uh, of uh, the purifying work of God. Have a look at uh, verse, uh, well, verse nine again. Um, do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the guilty, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, 
you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I've chatted to uh, unbelievers sometimes and uh, heard someone say, look, I would like to be a Christian, but obviously I can't be because I'm gay. And I want us to notice what it says here and be really clear about it. Um, a large number of the church in Corinth had been men who had sex with, with men. Um, he doesn't mention women in this passage here, but he does elsewhere, and it's implied they're under the same category. Uh, these um, uh, Under uh, Roman culture uh, and uh, Greek culture, they didn't have a concept of sexual orientation the same way we do. And in fact, we didn't until you know, the, the, the 60s. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the use of boy prostitutes was quite common, uh, that, uh, you know, adolescents to be used in that way would be a great shame uh, to be a, an adult who was penetrated or uh, an adult who was attracted to a grown man. But uh, that, that view of uh, um, uh, doing that to, to young boys was, was deemed acceptable at the time. Paul is saying, listen, that does not stop you. Having done that in the past does not stop you entering the kingdom of heaven. Being someone who does that right now does not stop you coming to Jesus and being forgiven of your sin. You can't, can't wait until you've mended your ways. That's not how it works. You come to Jesus as you are and you ask for help and forgiveness and rescue. Uh, have a look at, uh, uh, at this list. There may be some things on there that you think, OK, well, that's that's terrible. That's the most serious thing. And uh, and they're the ones that I don't do. And there are some on the list there that, that clearly they're not anywhere near as bad. Uh, maybe there's uh, uh, greed. And you think, yeah, well, you know, I I like having more money than I need. And I like having nice things. And that's my right. I work harder than other people. And I'm just uh, I'm better than them. So I deserve to live better. And you think, OK, that's not that big a deal. Um, but uh, and slanderers, you know, we'll have a go at some people uh, and uh, and sometimes we'll go a bit far and say things that aren't fair. But, you know, it's not that bad. Swindlers, maybe uh, there's some business practice you're involved with or, or maybe, you know, you're just a big fan of the hustle. And uh, and you think, no, no, if uh, if other people are tricked, that's their lookouts. But, uh, there's, uh, but, but surely the amount we know affects how much how great our guilt is i've got uh, friends that um from the earliest times can't remember ever being attracted to the opposite sex and were only attracted to their own sex it's a challenge isn't it that's never felt like sin to them uh, there's uh, a friend of mine that uh, used to be in a gang uh, and uh, they were they were con men and uh, a friend of his suddenly became a Christian, shared the gospel with him, and he was saved too. But he'd never been to church when his friend, who shared the gospel with him, handed himself in to, uh, to the police. He'd done some terrible things in the past. He confessed to them and was taken into custody and jailed. So my friend had never been to church, but now trusted Jesus and now didn't know any believers on the outside for a long time he'd been in a bigamous relationship with two women and he had no idea it was wrong no one had ever told him didn't feel wrong he was enjoying it they didn't seem to mind it was all fine and until one day he met a christian who started discipling him and it was a shock to him he had to change his ways he had to talk to these women and end both relationships this wasn't the right way to to be living there's a uh, uh, it, at the end of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus explicitly says that it would be easier on the day of judgment for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah than for the people of Capernaum. Pe the people of Caper Capernaum had seen Jesus in the flesh, walking around, preaching the gospel, explaining how they could be forgiven and rescued by God, had seen the miracles and they had rejected him. They were 
sexually ethical. They were they were observant Jews. Uh, outwardly, their lives were far less scandalous than the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, who engaged in mass gang rape. And yet Jesus says, no, actually, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, if if what had happened, if they had seen what the people of Capernaum had seen, they would have repented. It'll be better for them in some way on the day of judgments than for the people of Capernaum. Recognize that we as Christians, people who are children of God, who have tasted the forgiveness and joy of belonging to the Lord Jesus, when we continue in our sin, when we say it doesn't matter, there's grace for that. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll make peace with that sin. It's a very, very serious thing, isn't it? We have all sinned. I hope you feel it this morning. You feel that, that being put to death by, uh, by God's words. But here's what makes us alive. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Whatever your history is, there is no bar in you coming to Jesus right now. And ask you for forgiveness, for rescue, uh, and for transformation from him. It doesn't mean that everything you're currently tempted by will be taken away. Okay, If you're single, don't think that getting married is the magical bullet that will solve all your issues with lust. As if, you know, there'll never be a time when one of you's in the mood and the other one isn't. Or uh, you need to be apart for, for a while and you just, no, 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 I'm just, you know, taking all that out on him or her no no whoever you are whatever you're tempted by you will have to grow in sanctification and exercise self-control that is how we become matured and if uh, if you really love jesus you will want to grow day by day in your self-discipline your maturity your godliness to be more like jesus who was tempted more than any of us and stood firm this is what we're called to but whoever you are whatever you've done there's washing for you sanctification that god has given jesus is our champion he has done it for us he he is the one who has washed us clean and we 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 stand fast in him let's pray now asking for his help and delighting that jesus is the hero who has rescued us from our sin. Heavenly Father, please keep us from that dangerous, wicked attitude of saying, look, never mind, there's always grace. Never mind, that's what Jesus is for. He'll, he'll clean up after me. No, that, uh, that arrogant, evil hypocrisy of saying that sin matters, but only other people's sin. Heavenly Father, keep us from that self-justifying attitude. Keep us from hiding, hushing up our own sin uh, whilst wanting to point out that of other people. Heavenly Father, keep us from that attitude that just wants to campaign to make uh, the pagans more holy, but not worrying about our own sin. Forgive us, Lord. Would we press on to sanctification in the Lord Jesus and love, live so that we live such good lives among the pagans that they want to know what our hope is. That they see that we genuinely are living for your kingdom. That we genuinely do belong to the Lord Jesus and serve him. So they'll want to know and they'll be drawn to you and they'll know that we believe that this is true and we are banking on it. So Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord, because it's not easy. Uh, help us to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, just to let you know, I've done something unreasonable during the service. And uh, this is just for Aaron and Beth, who are going to play the next hymn. I've changed what it is. OK, it's there in the uh, the playlist. And it's And Can It Be That I Should Gain. I just think thought it was a more appropriate one than the one that I picked. So uh, hopefully in a moment he will have got that ready. And we'll sing this uh, uh, this great gospel hymn. And can it be that I should gain? Sing with me. And can it be? And can it be that I should gain?
why is it that Charles Wesley can be so bold? Why is it that we can be bold, uh, sinners that we are, in approaching God's throne? Well, it's because it, God has sent Christ as a sacrifice for us. Let me finish with these words. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus. Lord, we cannot uh, finally conquer our sin. We cannot uh, improve ourselves. All we can do is trust in the Lord Jesus and follow him. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that we would indeed follow him. Lord, we would delight in his rescue of us and uh, we would not defy him. We would delight in him being our king. Lord, we thank you that he's understanding. He knows that we are weak, but Lord, may we never make peace with the sin that you find so abhorrent. Heavenly Father, may we not pretend that our temptations are worse than what other people face, that uh, our situation makes uh, refusing to obey you a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Heavenly Father, may we delight to belong to Jesus and not other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, 